together, we, we looked at this, uh, last time we were together in Matthew, I should say, we looked at this passage uh, as an overview, and uh, we had seen that there was a lot of controversy with um, the religious leaders of the day and Jesus over several matters. Uh, and the, the Pharisees, the leaders, wanted him destroyed. They decided that it was time for him to be gone. Um, there's a showdown where Jesus tells them, you know, uh, your father's prophesied by whatever, and they said he cast out demons by the, the hand of Baal and, and Beelzebub and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, and he said, well, if, if, if I did that, then Satan's kingdom wouldn't stand because if Satan casts out Satan, then how is his kingdom going to stand? But he said, if I cast these demons out by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And this is really like a, a big showdown with them. Um, this first part of Matthew 12 shows the controversy over the, the, the role of the Sabbath and the, the relationship between Sabbath and labor and this kind of thing. And some people have misunderstood this text. They think that Jesus is violating the actual laws of God, and uh, he, he really hasn't. Uh, what is going on here is, in essence, the, the decision is who has authority to interpret the Old Testament. This is really the question that's driving this, this issue that, that comes forth. So today we're not going to go further than uh, verse 8. So we're just gonna look at this in brief, um, remembering that we've, we've already surveyed the chapter. So we wanna focus on these details as they appear. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath, that he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for allowing us to have this time we can open your word together and look at its teaching above all its grand subject the Lord Jesus Christ and we see him in his full majesty we see him in his humanity we see him in his care and concern for people we see him as the true Israel we see him as the authentic and rightful interpreter of the Old Testament scripture so God, bless our time, bless us as we look to your word and gain insight for our own lives. And may we ever draw closer to Christ, our Lord and our Savior. In his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Alright, so here we have this instant instance where... Um, says that the, the Sabbath is the focus here. So Jesus went through the grain fields, it says, on the Sabbath. So Jesus is doing what the Pharisees had interpreted to be a violation of the Sabbath. Now, whether that's the case or not is, is you know, not really in dispute because, first of all, when the Jews, they reap their fields, they were supposed to leave, you know, sheaves for the poor people and for travelers and this kind of thing, so that there would be food 
available. Okay. So on the one hand, if there were none of these provisions, then the spirit of the, the Old Testament law concerning caring for those more disadvantaged than you were has been violated. On the other hand, there you know there is this instance of um, you know misunderstanding God's intent of the law, and so what we have here is an example of the Pharisees misunderstanding the intent of the law and turning the Sabbath into a, a sort of governor over the lives of people, whereas the Sabbath was supposed to be a blessing to the people. The Sabbath was designed based on the order of creation to provide rest for the people of God, to provide them a time for worship, to focus on God, it was not meant to be a burden. It was meant to be a blessing. In fact, when you go back into the narrative of Genesis and you see on the sixth day when it says that God rested and He blessed the Sabbath, the Sabbath was supposed to be a, 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 a blessing to the people. You see? So here, they have obviously misunderstood this and they've set up their own laws, and later on in chapter 15 we'll see where, you know, Jesus chides them for setting up the rules of man as the doctrines of God. And here, this is an example of that. Um, you know, Jesus counters their claim with their ignorance of the true word. They are appealing to traditions and Jesus is appealing to the Old Testament. If they were appealing to the Old Testament, then Jesus is appealing to the right interpretation of the Old Testament. So every time when the Pharisees bring something up, he challenges them. He is the rightful interpreter of whether they are, you know, in the in the right or not. And he is indicating to them that they are not. He, he counters their challenge about, you know, the disciples doing something that is not lawful with this. He says, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him but only for the priests. Now, of course, some people look at this and say, see, David violated the law, and therefore anyone can violate the law, and as long as there's a good reason for it, then it's okay. That's not what Jesus is saying. David is a prefigure of the Messiah. David is a symbol of the one who is to come, who is prophet, priest, and king. So when David, as the messianic forerunner, does what he does, he does it with that authority. He doesn't do it merely as uh, you know an average Israelite, and so anybody can go do this. Jesus isn't saying, "Well, if David did it, anyone can do it." What he's what he's pointing to David as is as the model of who is to come, and in fact. He is the one who is greater than you know, greater than the temple, Jesus Himself. What He's saying is, look, David did this, and he ate of the bread that was permissible only for the priests to eat. But that same bread, after two or three days, was utilized and given to the people. So there are many senses in which why what David did was not wrong. But primarily, it's the interpretation of this passage that Jesus is showing that the, the, you know, the Pharisees are wrong. They're wrong in their application of their own standards to challenge the behavior of Jesus' disciples with appeal to religious tradition. And Jesus is saying, look, even in the Old Testament itself, David is doing something 
that because he's David, the point is that because he's David, look at what he did, now look at one who is the fulfillment of David. Look at one who is greater even than the very temple. So the Sabbath law is, you know, something that was designed to be a blessing to man. It's not to burden the Son of Man, but the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. So look at what David did. It says he and his men were hungry. He entered, he ate the sugar, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. So he's drawing attention to the one thing. Have you not read? Where? In the Old Testament. This narrative comes from the Old Testament. Have you not read the other thing, he says? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Again, have you not read? Where? In the Old Testament. If, if we look to their suggestion, you know, you're doing something that is unlawful on the Sabbath, where? Not in the Old Testament. That is the point, you see. That is a human tradition. But even if they can appeal to some scripture, which obviously they're not, you know, there are scriptures that are applicable to this issue concerning the Sabbath and what have you. Jesus is saying that he ultimately has the right to interpret the word of God and interpret it in light of his coming and who he is. He is the only one who can rightly interpret the, the, the word of God for him. And so, have you not read? Have you not read? Well, the, the, the priests in the temple, they violate because they work, and yet they are blameless. Why? Because they're ministering in the temple. The temple is the place of God's residence. Their service in the temple supersedes that which is the Sabbath law. Well, one greater than the temple is here. You begin to see the logic here. You begin to see what is going on. When the priests are fulfilling their ministry, it's okay. Jesus is like David, the king. Jesus is like David, the one who interprets the word of God. Jesus is like David at work, working in the priest ministry by going and taking the showbread. David foreshadows the one who will come, who will be prophet, priest, and king of his people. So these are our dots being connected by Christ and showing that these Old Testament saints, they misunderstood. They crucified him at the end of the day. They put him to death. He came to fulfill the word of God. They wanted him destroyed. He came preaching the kingdom of God. They wanted him destroyed. He came and bore the sins of many. They wanted him destroyed. When they actually, you know, asked for Pilate to crucify him, they weren't doing it because they read Isaiah 53 and they were trying to fulfill the word of God. They did it because they hated him. They put him on the cross out of wicked intention. God put him on the cross because of his love for sinners like you and like me. That is the difference. Jesus comes as the authoritative expert on the word of God. It shouldn't surprise us. Because the Word of God inscripturated in the Holy Bible is nothing more than a reflection of the mind of God and what we call the Word who was God incarnated. The Word inscripturated on the one hand, the Word incarnated on the other. We have the Bible and we have Jesus. We have these authorities to appeal to. The Bible is the final authority, but the Bible as interpreted by Jesus is the final absolute authority in these last days it says he has spoken to us through his son everything that went before now has to be read in light of the coming of christ here he is in their midst and they mis misunderstood he was the teacher he was the rabbi he was the famous one who did healings and miracles and things and at every turn they oppose him they try to you know, discredit him. They try to trap him, they try to trick him, they try to bamboozle him, but at every point, Christ, his majesty is evident, 
his wisdom is far superior, and at the end of the day, his obedience was such that it outshone even the zeal of the Pharisees. He went to a death of a cross that was humiliating, that was a death of a criminal, but not so much the death itself, but what it really was, the absorbing of the wrath of God in his people. One greater than the temple is here. The temple now is Christ. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. And the text says, John 2, he was speaking of the temple of his God. In the physical presence of Jesus of Nazareth, we have God manifest in the flesh, the new temple of God. And now he's building with us a new spiritual temple in which his spirit may dwell, in whom we have the privilege of proclaiming the excellencies of his name and what he has done. Yes, he says, one greater than the temple is here. He said, if you had known this, you wouldn't be caught up with all this religious talk. He said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Again, if you had known this, from where? From the Old Testament, from the scriptures. Again, they appeal to Rabbi so-and-so, Jesus appeals to God. They appeal to the experts, God is the ultimate authority for Jesus, the Word of God. You see, there's the big difference between what they are trying to do and what he is accomplishing in his life and ministry in the bringing disciples together as a nucleus of a church that would go around the world and change the face of mankind. He said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And he's quoting from the scriptures and he's saying to them, look, there are weightier matters. This is what he says in Matthew 23 when he chastises them so, so strongly. He says, look, there are weightier matters. You tie a mint and a knees and come in. You swallow a camel and you strain a gnat. He says, look, I desire mercy. God. Faithfulness. These are the essence of the law. These are the weightier matters. He said, these you should have done without having undone the other. Yes, the law of God is the law of God, but there are differences of emphasis. What they are doing is they are actually leading people astray with their interpretations of the Word of God, with their misappropriation of the Bible's language, and putting burdens on the people which they themselves will not lift with a finger. They will not even try to attempt to do the very things that they charge others on. He says, had you known this, you would not have condemned the guilt ones. Now, in terms of looking at this, he's saying that the disciples on the one hand are guiltless in a violation that the Pharisees are charging them with. But on the other hand, he's also saying the Son of Man is guiltless from all things, you wouldn't be condemning me. The real problem that you have is not with the, Phar the Pharisees looking at the disciples. Your real problem is that they are disciples of me. Your problem is that they are my disciples and that they are not your disciples. And so you charge them because they associate with me and you see them doing something that you think according to your tradition is wrong and so you just want to point the finger at me saying no. no if you understood you would have known and you would not have condemned the guiltless but so that you know he says here it is the son of man is lord even over the sabbath in mark's version you find that the sabbath was given for man not man for the sabbath the Sabbath was created to be a blessing for man. Man wasn't made so that he could fit into some legal system that was already in place. No. The Sabbath was given to man as a blessing, and they had misunderstood it. At the end of the day, not only this text or the text that they are alluding to, 
but the very spirit of the entire Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. And in a word, what we have is a Redeemer who is prophet, priest, and king. He is prophet in that he is the authoritative interpreter of the word of God. He is priest in that he ministers at the altar for us. He is the priest and the sacrifice. And he is king who is risen from the dead, is Lord of all. He is indeed the Lord who is in the heavens and does whatever he pleases. If we put our faith in him, we are in no better hands. If we look to the traditions of men, ultimately we, like these Pharisees, will be deceived, and then on the final day, we will be condemned. Let us turn to Christ. Let us look to Christ. Let us love Christ. Let us serve Christ. Let us follow Christ all the days of our life. And then we will dwell in the house of God forever. Let's pray. Dear God, we praise you, we love you. We are unworthy of you, Lord, yet we long to come close. But we're also fearful because we know how unholy we are. Yet what a blessing to be robed in the garments of your Son. What a blessing to know that that large barrier that kept us out of the Holy of Holies has been torn asunder by your very hand. And that your Son died to give us access. We might boldly come before your throne of grace in time of need. Oh God, what a great privilege. And so we burst through, Lord, coming towards you, thanking you for the great love you've shown us in Christ. We come thanking you that we will not be condemned because now we are guiltless in Christ. We come not to a temple made with hands, but to one made without hands, to the city of the living God, to the temple that is the true. Oh God, we love you. We thank you that we have this wonderful future ahead of us. No matter what happens in this world, no matter how many point the finger and charge us with wrongdoing, no matter how many Pharisees or Sadducees there are out there that want us condemned, that we have you to stand in our stead and plead our guiltlessness because of your sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you. And may you receive all the glory from your people. Through Christ we pray. Amen.